This is the sixth of seven videos preparing us for Easter. The ceremonies of Holy Saturday begin with tenebrae. In the first nocturne, the Psalms mention resting in peace, in hope, in sleep. So is Jesus in the tomb. In the second nocturne, the Psalms sing of Jesus' triumphal entry into heaven, his dwelling there, and gladness. And in the third nocturne, the Psalms show how the hostility, vengeance and abandonment of Maundy Thursday and Good Friday are turned to triumph, freedom and peace through the resurrection. At some point after this come the ceremonies of the Easter Vigil, which we may think of in four parts. The blessings of fire, incense and light, the reading of the twelve prophecies, the blessing of the Easter water and Holy Mass of the Lord's Resurrection. Don Prosper Granger describes all this as the longest and most trying service of the Latin liturgy. To interpret the whole, he observes that all rites of the Easter Vigil converge on baptism. Let us see how this is so. As the resurrection took place outside of Jerusalem, so the Vigil begins outside of the church, with the blessing of the new fire. Ideally, the fire is produced from flint, that is, from stone, as Jesus, the light of the world, rose up from the stone tomb. The second prayer, although short, mentions light nine times. So important is this light of the resurrection. We may think of the Shroud of Turin, the image of which appears to be burnt onto it by an incredible burst of radiation, of supernatural light. With the resurrection, Jesus ignited a fire of love, to illumine us with heavenly grace. Then comes the blessing of the five grains of incense, which will be attached to the paschal candle. The blessing speaks of the secret mixture of thy light, for nobody witnessed the resurrection except God alone. And what a relief for us that through it all the malicious artifices of Satan will be defeated. The spark which jumped from the flint as Jesus from the tomb ignites the new fire which provides a source both of heat for the thurible and light for the candles. For the procession into the church, the deacon carries a triple candlestick mounted on a single reed, representing the Most Holy Trinity in union with the humanity of Christ. Three times the procession pauses for these candles to be lit in turn, each time the deacon holding it aloft and singing in a successively rising tone, Lumen Christi, the light of Christ. All respond by kneeling in adoration and singing Deo Gratias. Thanks be to God. As the triple candle may represent the Blessed Trinity, then lighting the first one honours the Son's revelation of God the Father, the second one the Son's revelation of his own divine identity, and the third one his revealing the Holy Ghost. Then comes the blessing of the Paschal candle, the Exalted. The deacon alone is vested in joyful white, he is blessed with words similar to those preceding any gospel. After singing how this night drives forth hatreds, prepares concord, and brings down haughtiness, the deacon affixes the five grains of incense to the paschal candle, reminding us of the five blessed wounds of Christ which overcome hatreds and haughtiness, and attaching them to the unlit candle represents the women adorning Christ's dead body with perfumes and ointments. After singing the praises of this pillar to the honour of God, the deacon uses the triple candle to light the paschal candle. This represents the moment of the resurrection. From this candle will be lit all the other lights in the church, including those held by the faithful, to symbolise that the gospel goes out from Christ to the whole world, and more than this, he gives us his resurrection, his life as well. As a fire, though divided into parts, suffers no loss from its light being borrowed, so we also will share in the resurrection of Christ, without him suffering any diminishment of glory, and ours can only be a consequence of his, as the other lighted candles are consequences of the paschal candle being lit. Next comes the reading of the twelve prophecies. All of these allude to baptism. They were chosen to take a long time, so that the many catechumens could be simultaneously prepared for baptism. They begin with Genesis 1, creation. For tonight, Easter offers regeneration to creation. Fiat lux, let there be light. And there was light. This is light 
rising from the darkness as Jesus rose from the tomb. There is the water. The waters were divided and gathered so dry land may appear, representing eternal life appearing amidst death. And God who created the first Adam on this holy night raises the new Adam who brings everlasting life. Man is wonderfully made, yet more wonderfully regenerated. The next prophecy is from Genesis 5, telling of Noah's ark. Now the waters wash away sin, as the waters of baptism cleanse our soul. The ark alone carries the survivors, a little family which will go on to people the whole earth. Such is the church. The third prophecy is from Genesis 22, Abraham offering Isaac. Abraham's faith is a lesson in the resurrection, who believed that though his son was sacrificed, he would live, and great blessings come to the whole world through him. This new generation we gain through baptism. The fourth prophecy is from Exodus 14, the parting of the Red Sea, a great figure of baptism in which God's children escape slavery while God's enemies, Satan, sin and death, are destroyed. This is followed by Miriam's song as the tract, and a prayer that all the nations of the world may become the children of Abraham and partake in the dignity of the people of Israel. Such are the Jewish roots of Christianity. The next prophecy is from Isaiah 55. All you that thirst come to the waters, obviously baptism, through which a new nation is born in grace, a nation until then not known, and to whom all the nations of the world shall run. Barak 3 tells us that wisdom is the way to life. Baptism is the fountain we must not forsake, or we will end in hell. Ezekiel 37 speaks of the resurrection of dry bones. God sends his spirit into us that we may live, and this occurs in baptism. We see this now by the eyes of faith, but at the general resurrection, when God opens the sepulchres and brings his people out of their graves, all shall see it, that life comes from the spirit. Isaiah 4 speaks of seven women asking to receive the name of one man. We may think of the seven sacraments, which are all a contact with Christ, and so catechumens in baptism take on Christ's name, becoming Christians. Exodus 12 speaks of the Paschal Lamb, through whom the redeemed are to understand that the creation of the world at the beginning was not a greater work than the immolation in the fullness of time of Christ our Passover. Through his death and resurrection is a new creation. Jonah 3 tells of the people of Nineveh responding to God's call. So the people of the world, full of sin, are called to repent and to fast. Then they can be confident of salvation. They are an image of the catechumens approaching baptism. In Deuteronomy 31, Moses witnesses against the stiff-necked people whom he is sure will fall away once he is dead, as they did while he was alive. So we should be mindful to keep our Holy Week devotion through the whole year. The fervor of this night should not pass away after Easter time. The final prophecy is of Daniel 3, the three young men in the fiery furnace. It is a final admonition to the catechumens before their baptism that one must be ready to die rather than to bow down to false gods. The other eleven prophecies were followed by the call Flectamus Genua, let us genuflect. For adoring God we may then arise, rise again. But after this reading it is not said, for we should never bow down to idols. We were not baptized for that. The singing of the twelve prophecies has taken a long time, during which the many catechumens could be prepared for their baptism. In the first millennia, while the catechumens were being prepared to go to the baptistry, the baptistry was being prepared to receive them. That was, seven subdeacons would gather there, and they would sing the litany of saints, First, with every invocation being repeated seven times, then again with every invocation being repeated five times, and then again with every invocation being repeated three times. It's incredible, but so was the trust in calling on the help of the saints for the magnificent new life about to begin. The procession to the baptistry is led by the deacon carrying the paschal candle as the pillar of cloud or fire. The scholar sings Sicut Chervis, as the heart panteth after the fountains of water, so my soul panteth after thee, O God. There have been tears of repentance, ahead of rebirth, 
through the fountains of God's waters in the sacrament of baptism, wherein we are regenerated and adopted as a new people, sons of God. The Church Fathers testify that the blessing of the baptismal waters is of apostolic origin. It is introduced as and sung to the tone of a preface, as were the palms one week before on Palm Sunday. As water may signify both death and life, we hear how the waters of the flood both purged the earth and spread sediment, which is like a blessing on new growth. So one and the same element might in a mystery be the end of vice and the beginning of virtue. At this point, the priest divides the waters with the sign of the cross, a mysterious mixture of divine virtue rendering the waters fruitful. For God's children to be born from the immaculate womb of this divine font, immaculate with all unclean spirits commanded by the Lord to depart, and the whole malice of diabolical deceit entirely banished. Satan is terrified by baptism. Three more crosses are made over the waters to bless them, and reference given to the four rivers which flowed from paradise, commanded to irrigate the whole earth, as through Christ does grace. Here the celebrant sprinkles the waters to the east, west, north and south. We may think how different are Asia and the Americas, Europe and Africa, yet in Christ all are one, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Approaching the mystical holiness, these words are not sung but recited. The celebrant breathes three crosses onto the water and then plunges the paschal candle into them three times deeper and deeper, accompanied by chanting in a higher and higher tone, may the virtue of the Holy Ghost descend into all the water of this font. And he breathes the Greek letter Psi over the waters for Pneuma, the Spirit, who makes the whole substance of this water fruitful for regeneration. The threefold rising tone reminds us of the Ecce Lignum Crucis of Good Friday and the Lumen Christi at the beginning of the Vigil. Just as then everyone was to gaze upon the cross or be illumined by the candles, so now the people are sprinkled with the new waters, recalling their being born again, children of true innocence. Finally, the oils of catechumens and chrism are added, first singly and then, to symbolize baptism, together. Baptisms and confirmations of the catechumens follow, as does the litany of saints. Ideally, with every single invocation being sung twice. The triumphant rites of the vigil are reaching their climax. During the chanting of the litany, the sacred ministers go to the sacristy to vest for the mass of the Lord's resurrection. As the end of the litany merges with the majestic ninefold Kyrie Christe Kyrie Eleison, the celebrant emerges from the sacristy and lining up with the ministers begins the prayers at the foot of the altar. Hence there is no introit for this Mass. The Gloria is accompanied by the pealing of bells. St. Paul tells us we are dead if we have died to the world and died with Christ in baptism. Yet our life is hid with Christ in God, so when he shall appear, then his own shall appear in glory with him. There follows a triple Alleluia, and in contrast, a tract for a Lenten character endures until the Gospel announces Christ's resurrection. The deacon is accompanied by the thurifer, but not by the acolytes, for the women came with sweet spices, but not yet with the light of faith. The Gospel includes those wonderful words, Surexit enum sicut dixit, for he is risen, as he said. Jesus tells us the essentials in advance, but we are slow to believe, like the apostles. Therefore the creed is not prayed in this Mass, as it is the symbol of faith. Also there is no proper offertory prayer, originally because of logistics, and the Pax is omitted, as is the Agnus Dei because its third response includes mention of the Pax, but Jesus has not yet come to the Apostles to say, My peace I give you. Formerly there was no opportunity for Vespers on Holy Saturday, for the vigil service began after noon and continued until well after midnight. However, once it began to be anticipated earlier and earlier in the day, it was seen fit to compose a Vespers. It is exceedingly short and joyful of character, beginning after the communion prayer of the Mass and the concluding prayer, which serves also as the post-communion of the Mass. To the Ite Missa Est is added a double Alleluia, which is kept throughout the whole week. The only begotten Son of God 
has shared his grace and truth with the world so that through his death and resurrection there are now millions, billions of sons of God. The happiness of Easter is so great that most of us need many, many years to begin to absorb it.